Week one is in our rearview mirror, and now we're heading straight into week two with plenty of action, plus a few roster moves to talk about, and maybe a little bit of reminiscing of spring stock and week one of all things. James Larson's with me today. This is the UFL podcast, and it starts right now. One, two, three. Oh! Welcome everybody into the UFL podcast. I am Zach Kyleman hosting this week. And uh, you may be wondering, hey, uh, where, where's my uh, very, very much uh, high on life Roughnecks fan, the ref? That, this isn't him. This isn't even the mailman. This is James Larson with me this week, joining me on the UFL podcast for episode 80, week two on the other side of this when we get to prep you for that and get a few other nuggets as well james uh good to see you man uh getting to sit in and get a guest hosting seat this week a little double duty here outside atu how, how you been how's the uh how's the life of a busy editor in chief going for you doing well you know a little bit of breaking news uh the ref has decided to leave this show 12 and out guys i the comment section is gonna be so thrilled that they won't have to hear 12 and 0, rough them up all in this week. Guys, don't worry. You do not have to worry about that with me. Okay. You're just going to get straight up UFL talk here. We're not going to glaze the roughnecks anymore. We're going to give an honest opinion on this team and how bad they were in week one. Uh, they were so bad that ref decided to leave the show. So I that's get a little bit. <laughs> I get a little vacation. You're saying, oh. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. I, I'm ready for it when it comes back. But for now, I get to, my mind gets to breathe a little bit. And uh, I also get to rep Paul's Law a little bit more on this show. Uh, pump out my chest, at least for at least for about two days. We get about two days, and then we'll maybe talk about talk about if that continues or not as we go down the show. Um, but yeah, no, we'll give an honest evaluation of all these teams, of course, and uh, you know, give some final thoughts leading into week two, but also got a few transactions and the like. And uh, if anything... Well, you want to talk some stories, especially for yourself, since, uh, you know, you had your own experience week one as much as we did over at Springstock. So, James, we got plenty to discuss today. Before we do that, everybody, as always, we got the intro items to get out of the way for you. So first things first, uh, have you followed any of our socials? Uh, if you're not, if you haven't, what are you doing? Uh, jump on over. UFL podcast for any of your Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. ATU around the UFL. I'm going to pump that show heavy, especially when I got my man here, James, who is one of our, who is basically the showrunner to me to get this bad boy going around the UFL. Follow it along. We're growing. It's getting big for us. It's been a freaking amazing show every week. Had Brock Miller on last week, and that show popped off post week one. So you definitely want to check out who we're going to have possibly next for Monday's episode, 6 p.m. Eastern on this same channel, by the way, don't miss out as well. Hey, and if you, you haven't to... watched Brock Miller's yes. episode, you got to go ahead and watch oh, no, you it. Should. I mean, we got some awesome breakdown of the, I mean, come on, if you haven't seen Jake's pick Jake Bates kick yet, what are you doing? I mean, and Brock breaks it down for us as a holder. I mean, just, just legendary commentary on that one. So do yourselves a favor. I love the nerves of steel kind of thing he busted out there with that show last week, by the way, because uh, I'll be honest when Nick asked that I was expecting, you know, it's like, eh, give me some goosebumps. And he just kind of stone cold looked at the camera and said, eh, it's nothing. No, Easy that's because he's Brock MF Miller, man. I mean, that it's just, he's just that guy. Easy money. For Mr. Miller this last week. Who knows? Maybe we'll see some more easy money coming up for whoever joins us on Monday. You don't want to miss it. But yeah, Brock, check out that interview. It's popping off. It was a great show. Glad we got to have him on. Excellent character and one of the one of the class acts of this league. So stick around for more on ATU. By the way, you want to support both these shows, by the way? Uh, got a great deal for you. Breaking Tea. Yeah, they're back once again as a uh, official merch partner for the UFL this time around. 10% off your purchase using USFL Newsroom. I know it's an old code, but that's okay. USFL Newsroom on checkout gets you 10% off. Supports all our shows over here on the website and uh, helps us bring you great content, not only on these videos, but through the great articles that we all write on that website as well. And uh, 
as I keep saying, we pump them out this year. We are getting this stuff out. I'll, I'll tell you what, James, I was wanting to write my preview, but everybody's beat me to the previews this week. And I went, okay, I guess I've got to re-up and just kind of just take the bull by the horns next week and grab mine because you always get some. But, uh, you know, we got our buddies over here that just, like I said, everyone's pretty. Gavin was very enthusiastic in St. Louis this week. And uh, Chris, of course, with DC, I'm not shocked, but I was like, oh, I missed my chance. I'll get you another one next week, though. <laughs> no worries. No worries. It's all good. Hey, the previews. Yeah, we got a couple more rolling out tomorrow. So stay tuned. I mean, PFN, I, I just got to give credit to everybody there. I mean, we have been pumping out the content lately. We've had every roster breakdown. We've had all every game preview, every game recap, and that's going to continue. So, hey, get locked in at pfnewsroom.com. There's no better time to follow along with PFN right now. Uh, by the way, PF Newsroom or UFL Newsroom, if you want the latest from anything from Pro Football Newsroom's website and pfnewsroom.com for all the latest. All right, let's get into this thing for the show. I always did this last year. Me and the ref, we do this every episode last year during the season. I know week two is ahead of us. I know it's been almost the week since the end of week one. But let's give a little bit of reminiscing. We always get final thoughts in. Uh, this one in particular, look, spring stock just happened last week, James. You're you're on site and in lawn location for arguably one of the most, if not the most memorable game of the past week itself. I mean, I got we gotta talk stories here. And actually, you know, I, I I'm gonna give you the floor first because I want to hear man. Look, you you were there on turf. You watch Jake hit this 64 yard and you watched a hell of a second half of a game. Like, I don't even want to take away just the kick seems, you know, it, it takes a lot of the oxygen out of the room, but that second half over in Detroit electric late third quarter, fourth quarter, bang, bang, bang. Everyone's scoring. Everyone's trying to get that last bit in. And that's how I want to see these games come down to the wire. You were front row and got some excellent photos, by the way, of a great event. Yeah, I mean, that was just an awesome experience, and not just the kick, but like you said, the second half. I mean, the first half was entertaining as well, but defensive battle, just some mishaps, and what you'd expect from spring football, right, in week one, where offenses are just trying to figure things out. There's no preseason game, so defense is always going to have that edge. But the second half, you know, you saw EJ Perry really settle into it, and he, EJ kind of remembered that he could run, you know? I felt like yeah. that first half, he kind of just kept forcing throws where he didn't have to force them, and then the second half, he was like, wait a minute. I have legs. I am a mobile quarterback. And then, you know, next thing you know, he rushed for two touchdowns. That comeback, it was such an interesting fourth quarter because it was so reminiscent of the St. Louis Battlehawks opener last year where they were yeah. down by, you know, a couple scores. I know Michigan wasn't up by two scores, but very similar where you had Marcel Aitman making some big plays at the end of that game, almost identical to what happened in San Antonio. So, you know, right when St. Louis took that lead, Mar first of all, the fourth and ten, I mean, ever at that point, I thought Michigan had the game on lock. And then Marcel right. Aitman goes up between two guys, I think Keith Gibson and Kai Nakua, and he just comes down with that ball, perfectly placed pass by A.J. McCarron. And the next next thing you know, on third and fourth goal, next thing you know, Marcel Aitman again. And again, a perfectly placed ball by A.J. McCarron. You could just tell that the air was sucked out of Ford Field. Like, the, the, they, the fans, they were upset. Now, the Battlehawks fans, they traveled, let me tell you. I mean, there was a lot of calling they in those stands – and they were going crazy. But then I mean, uh, yeah. you could hear the defense chants during the last drive. It was audible on the broadcast. So it, not surprised. I mean, it's not that far of a drive, but like clearly showed up in droves. Uh, week two, they're in, in house. I just, that's going to be so fun to see that crowd get its home game again. Yeah, it, it was great to see them travel. I'll make a, another comment about that in a second. But uh, to get back to the, to the final moments of this game, you know, Jake Bates, I, I got to give EJ Perry credit for pushing the ball down the field on a couple of those passes. He found John Hightower for a huge first down because people forget they were fourth and six and converted there just to get Jake into that field goal territory. Right. Did we think it was field goal territory? I don't know. I mean, I'll be honest. I, I was thinking that there, he didn't have a shot. And uh, next thing you know, he comes out there, he boots it through. And so I'm talking to one of the photographers next to me and I'm like, Hey, just a heads up, uh, Jake Bates, he has not attempted a field goal since high school. And the look that she gave me, she was like, like, what is he doing out there? I was on the me. team, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, you know, he gets out there and then he boots it through and we heard the time I was called the whistle blue. And I'm like, Oh man, like that's sick. Can I, you know, I'll be honest. I was kind of expecting the second kick to, I saw he had an amazing leg, but you know, in those situations, you get iced from 64 yards out. Very rarely do you see someone hit another one of those. 
Oh, Next yeah. thing you know, he knocks it through, and yeah, pandemonium. It, it was insane. <laughs> well, uh, you, some of you that may have listened to both of our shows, you might have heard uh, the the ref or mailman, whoever you want to go with at that time, bring up the story of myself where it's, I'm going to be honest, I did a total, total fandom thing where I was like, man, Cole Murphy should never been cut before that 64-yarder. And then he hits that, and it's complete different. I'm like, oh, wow, we actually might, got this, might have this in the bag. Just it's amazing how that works out. And then uh, later saying, you know, it's even farther back than high, high school in terms of how impressive it was where it's like, oh, yeah, not just hasn't kicked since high school. Like, you didn't even really kick in high school. <laughs> right. Either. Yeah. Tony Paul did some research and saw that, like, he had hardly even kicked there. Like, it's just such an unbelievable story. Like, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it, to be completely honest. But, like, <laughs> this is exactly why spring football exists. So you, you got to love it. Jake Bates next day on Pat McAfee's show. I mean, what a story, man. I, it's hard to even put it into words. Um, the one thing I did want to point out, too, really quick about the Battlehawks fans, I was impressed with how they traveled. And last year when I was in the hub with Michigan and Philadelphia, it was interesting. The few fans that really traveled were New Orleans Breakers fans. They came out wow. for a Philadelphia Stars game. Now, the fans that traveled, there was about six of them. But they made a lot of noise for six people. And they were, it was the first time I'd really seen fans travel to Ford Field. And this year, Battlehawks, there had to have been at least several hundred Battlehawks fans there. Like, I was really, really impressed with, with them showing up. Very nice. Very nice. And uh, we know for a fact from Springstock that uh, our own guys who were friends on Fuel Network, they were over there too, dirty and the like, uh, getting a tune in. So brought good contingent over there. And again, I, I, like I said, very audible the last drive. Like, there were defense chants going on while EJ Perry's trying to conduct the offense. That doesn't doesn't happen with anyone else, and I can't imagine many other fan bases in the league right now, just given distance, will uh, do that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we see that change, but impressive nonetheless. New Orleans, those six fans, still. I, I want now uh, Breakers come back someday, baby. I really need this te team. I mean, the to question exist is, again. do they have six fans left? We'll see. Hard to tell. Hard to tell for sure. Now, you obviously were involved in spring stock, uh, clearly. Um, and like I said, I'm glad I got to hear your Ford Field experience because, like, it's just – I almost wish I was there. Not to say spring stock wasn't great at all, and I enjoyed my time in Arlington nonetheless. But uh, still, my team plus that, you get what I'm saying. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, look, the Panthers are your team, and there's just something special about a 64-yard walk-off. Well, I mean. that too. <laughs> Kind of adds a bit bit of flair to it, you know. Makes it. No, maybe more... next time we can figure out a way to like teleport or something. Hopefully by twenty twenty five, that's a thing. The technology's got to catch up. We are, yeah. we are far behind. The time is now, James. We must we must seize the day. We must bring this to the foray of it for football fans everywhere, so we can do this and be in person. Um, what I will tell you is this: yeah, for the spring stock and for the Arlington festivities, you know. Uh, first off, I got to put out there for everyone that joined, including yourself, James. You know, we had Mark Perry on there, Dirty and Arlington Lane and company from Fuel Network. We had a bunch of Fuel Network people out there, Mrs. Predator, that is, being the one that's helped us with a fan camp and everything. Uh, Luke Miller going out. That event was so damn fun. Um, and I already, we already said this in ATU, but I'll say it again. It was so damn fun. And everyone who maybe is watching, I got to thank you personally for making it that special. We were not sure how this one would go. It was a different atmosphere this year than last year. Last year, let's just say some things were a lot more concrete and some other items were uh, a lot more fleshed out because of the, well, we cover one league. This year, we're still, much like the merger, we're figuring things out as we go too. And with it, we leaned and help, had help from you guys out there in the community. And as we are not surprised now, community showed out and the community helped us make an incredible spring stock. One that is one of my favorites since we've been doing this type of show. So thank you very much for everyone that came out there. Uh, secondly, I got to post the clip of uh, me, Ref, and Luke almost eating it with the freaking picnic table because I haven't done that yet. And I got to get that out. It's uh I really thought we were going over and that would be the show. It's just everything breaks. <laughs> I went back so and close. watched your face in slow motion and it's it's gold. <laughs> Definitely have to get that one posted. That's, a, it was, that's an instant done. classic. <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself like, yeah, I'm going over. But like we're talking like laptop, audio mixing tables and everything just going trash. My camera will get eaten up because it's connected to everything. So I'm just going to fly. 
freaking freaking buck man over at ufm he he gets the best shout out because he uh he ended up being the counterweight that saved us he freaking put it if it wasn't for him putting his foot down on the on that picnic table we eat it that, that's it's that simple we man, would have been ca- done the camera must have missed that part yeah well he he did a good job keeping off camera i'm not gonna lie because uh I'm impressed he, he, he helped us every time we had another guest on because you know we had you rewatch we had a few different times where we had three guests on there and the weight kind of started leaning back he he was great just show he just came up was like hey i got you man don't worry i asked him we had we kind of asked him aside if you want to be on didn't come on but you know unsung hero sir i know you're watching thank you very much for that you did a great job otherwise at the game once we packed up and got everything gotta tell you james Choctaw, I never have been yet, but I will say the uh, unique experience aspect that I hear from everybody, um, it's real. It is a uh, it is a bizarre place to sit at a baseball stadium with bleachers that are designed for football because um, it it's surreal. You want, someone said it best on one of the groups online. You feel like you're at a ballpark. It doesn't feel like you're supposed to be at a football game, uh, and they even reference it too. You know, we're going for media passes, James. And they're saying, oh, where do we go for passes? Uh, you got to go down the third baseline. I'm like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, third go to the third baseline. baseline. Yeah, you know, it's a ballpark. I guess, hey, Luis Perez is coming out as starting pitcher. What? Something like that? Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he would be a leadoff. He look, actually, he looked like he'd be a leadoff man. Someone like that. Get a bit of the speed. Get the first guy on bat. And then I think you'd have, like, say... Oh, how v, yeah, Vic Beasley would be like the uh, be like the third or fourth batter, you know, the cleanup guy. Cleanup gonna, guy. Oh yeah. yeah, he's gonna bring in the runs. That's what it's gonna be. Matt Corral could be anywhere. I think he'd be cleanup guy or leadoff. You know, you name it. CJ Marable to me would be the leadoff actually. Speedster. I'm done oh, talking absolutely. baseball. <laughs> I'm done talking hey, baseball. What about putting one of the old linemen in there for cleanup? I mean, I could see you know Matt Ooh. Katsky or someone getting out there. Cole Schneider. Cole Schneider. Yep. Okay. That guy, I like he's, where this is he's going. hitting a couple grand slams. Let me tell you, that mustache. I like, I like this. I like where this is going. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> the mustache Look at us. matches up perfectly. Baseball talk. It's baseball. opening week, right? In the MLB what or is? something along those lines, yeah. give or take. I know, right? About a week. Cubs are doing great. Four and two myself. Just got to be. Got to lay that out on the line. You have a base, James. You have a baseball team. Yeah, uh, Cincinnati Reds. I'm oh, all, really all over the place. Yeah, okay, so okay. I'm I'm really uh, depressed because Joey Votto is gone. So, so well, it's sad, hell of a sad, career though. Sad time. Hell of a career, man. Definitely deserves deserves it. But yeah, great contributions to the Reds organization right there, and uh, many a games where even with the Cubs' best years, still do to burn us. So, you know, I'll be all right. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, final thought. Final thoughts on spring stock. Just again. Great, great event. Um, I think they did a great job, by the way, at Choctaw. Um, just full disclosure, the production and in stadium production that is at Choctaw Stadium, like 10 to 20 times better than where it was at Rice Stadium. Like, James, if you would have been there, they Choctaw, they did everything right. They showed all the replays correctly, showed all the broadcast angles correctly for replays, showed all kinds of good graphics and had things to do for the audience. Houston, you'd be lucky if you got a replay after a play. Even the challenge calls, James, they didn't have replays. So if you had something like, for example, Vinny Papali's touchdown catch, we didn't get to see a close-up shot. They showed one shot, and then they stuck on a rotating graphic for about five minutes and then confirmed it. You know, they didn't say anything. We didn't hear Dean Blandino like sounding like God over the mega over the speakers. He just, it was just confirmed, just moved on. They tried one time. His audio didn't come through. They bailed on it night and day, man. You know, why doesn't that surprise me? Uh, Rice stadium. I kind of see that as one of the, the worst stadiums in the league. Uh, I don't think it's bad by any means. I just, you know, it's not up to par with some of the other stadiums that we have in the UFL. So it's not too surprising. And it, it is too bad that they weren't able to keep TDECU. I understand fully why that situation went down the way that it did with some of those renovations and the costs mm-hmm. and all that. But TDECU, no doubt. I mean, there's just no question in my mind that TDECU is the more professional-looking stadium for sure. And one would assume their technology there is a little bit newer and updated as well. Oh, by far. Uh, I think the most. I think the biggest complaint we got was um, 
And again, it's just it's facility. You know, you knew it was going to come with this. Uh, back, backed seats uh, instead yeah. of aluminum benches. That one was missed. And actually, random thing that we ran into, they banned stadium chairs. So, like people were like, someone snuck in and got one in. But like you know how those foldable chairs you can yeah. slap on aluminum benches like high school games, they wouldn't allow them in. At some point during the game, they started turning people away. So you gotta go put it back in your car. <laughs> so yeah. you couldn't even you couldn't even enhance your comfort. Was the down that to me is like the sort of thing. And look, I by no means know what's going on behind the scenes and why those rules might be in place. I'm sure there's reasons, but in a league like this, especially in a market like Houston, where you're trying to get whoever you can get to show up, that is not ideal. Like you gotta let someone in with the chair like that. If you're gonna stick them on aluminum benches in a hot rice stadium, let them at least get as comfortable as they can. You know, like we're, we're this is not the this is not the Texans. This is the Roughnecks who also are kind <laughs> of struggling. You know, it's like I don't know. I, I just would like to see the league or just there's got to be some way to have, be a little bit more lenient on those sorts of things. You know, it's, it's spring football. Come on. Well, yeah. I mean, the league can to me like. Maybe this isn't a one-to-one comparison, but I think of the XFL situation last year with the beer snake and how, like, you know, they had to talk with the venue and had to get the certain rules applied. Right. Like, look, I folding stadium chairs. If I wanted to do gymnastics, I could see liability, but that that's not how I want to do things in life. You know, reality is it should be for comfort. So Absolutely. my hope is, you know, you get enough complaints that policy gets changed. Cause look, even, and I'll speak for Stefan on this or the mailman, the ref, whatever you want to call it. I say all the names on here about who he is. And even he's like, he has two season tickets and we sat down at about the fifth row. And even midway through that game, he's like, you know, on the other side, they got shaded back chairs on the wayside. I might pick up those <laughs> wayside chairs and sit higher up because the comfort's that much better. Not to mention the sun also hits the home side pretty darn hard in the mid afternoon. And it's shaded on the away side. So uh, tip for Roughnecks fans. You might want to do those pretty soon. I know I know uh, the yeah, ref's already I, looking at it. I can imagine. I mean, all I know is I saw that picture of him slouched over in despair. So I can imagine he'd like to have a back seat the next time. So he's not as slouched over in despair when they lose again, which I'm To be sure frank, mo- I'm sure most, of my, most of my time of that game was spent consoling him. And uh, actually was trying to keep him encouraged. Hey. Don't worry. They they got they got this. Look, Memphis. They're not they're not executing properly. Give them time. And I still thought I gave him one last word of encouragement before Isaiah Henney muffed that punt. And after that, I went, "All right, let's go." <laughs> it was a day. yeah. That was that was tough. It was a day, but spring stock was a fun week. And honestly, week one. The chapter we now close. It's time to move on. It's week two. We're in the thick of things now, James. We have everything going towards our way and uh, leading us into now a full season where we're going to be looking at June 16th, going to St. Louis, by the way. Summer stock, early tease for summer stock, but we got time for that. We'll keep you posted later on. Just want to bring that up that we are uh, preliminarily beginning discussions on how that is all going to work out. Now, week two leading in. It's roster moves. Look, we got a few of them. Not too crazy, but I do want to bring up some, of course. And James, you're the guy that, as we always say, the Adam Schefter of PFN. You are the guy keeping us up on all these transactions as well. And uh, got a few we'll list off. One of, And there's about four of them here that are just different varying ones. One of them came down today, of all things. Um, and actually, might as well just do that with recency bias here. So Panthers picking up a receiver this week, today, as of today. Uh, CFC Mariner from Utah State. Last played with the Ottawa Red Blacks in 2023 for the CFL. He's jumped around a few NFL teams. And uh, honestly, given the Panthers' uh, setup in the roster, you know, not bad for depth, though, you know, that being said, it's he's not, I don't know if we see him immediately moving right up, but I do think they could use a more quality piece that is a receiver three or four uh, instead of leaning on, say, Cole Hikatini and Jordan Sewell as often, at least until you get Trey Quinn more involved, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so I have a few thoughts about this signing. For one, you look at their receiver room right now, and it's it's got a lot of talent, but there isn't like the one guy that really stands out as wide receiver one, which I think Mm -hmm. is a bit of a problem, right? Where you have Trey Quinn, you have Jordan Sewell, like you mentioned, John Hightower came over, made some plays. Devin Ross led the team in receptions with two. 
So like that's, that's, wild. that's the type of thing that you need to improve upon. You had two receptions for 46 yards. That's your leading receiver. You're not going to win football games if that keeps up. So I think you need a little bit more diversity there. You also need a bit more size. You got a couple smaller guys like Quinn, like Frost, and like Devin Gray. So now the uh, Mariner, he's six foot two, one ninety. So he's got a little bit more height. He has professional experience. He played with the Baltimore Ravens for a bit. He's hopped around. He was with Ottawa, Ottawa Red Blacks, and he, he started in nine games for them last year. So you yeah. know, he's got professional experience, recorded over 300 receiving yards, a couple touchdowns with the Red Blacks. Another thing I want to point out is he also played in the Spring League. When I was doing a little bit of research on him and his background, he was with the Generals in 2021, played with Ryan Mallett. Oh, yeah. Fly high, Ryan. Uh, but yeah, that's a that was a season he put up some decent numbers and then got some CFL interest out of it. So we'll see. I think he's a good depth piece, like you said. I don't see him moving up right away, but it is worth noting that John Hightower was listed on the injury report. He's kind of questionable. His status is up in the air for Sunday. So we, if Hightower is out, we definitely could see Mariner get thrown in there as like wide receiver five or wide receiver six. So mm-hmm. we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Now, another thing I want to point out. The Ottawa connection. I, this is more of a hunch than anything, but you got Marcel Belfay at offensive coordinator who also coaches for the Ottawa GGs. Uh, that's a college team up in Canada. So you, I'm hypothetically speaking, you wonder if there was some sort of auto connection there to get to get COC down here to Michigan. Because otherwise, like, I don't know. Like, I'm sure Steve Gazor has a lot of connections there in the CFL. He's a guy that's been in the CFL before, but I, I just thought that was interesting. No, I think it's good to point out. I mean, look, we talk a lot of times on, you know, finding avenues for talent, I think is a big deal. Um, And whoever is on your roster at your disposal to create avenues, I think helps. Look, Belfay being in the Canadian football scene, you know, that does open a little bit of a pathway. You know, maybe you can get some more connections or at least more ways of kind of feeling out feeders, if you will, to finding pieces that maybe fit what you want to do. So I do think that is something to bring up, something you want to an- analyze too. You know, we don't think about that as often as, you know, who's on what roster and what their backgrounds are to open up these avenues. So, you know, not too crazy, I would say, to assume that the Red Blacks connect, or at least the Canadian football connection has to play a little bit into this entire story. Hightower, as soon as you mentioned that too, I mean, absolutely. You know, a lot of teams, and we see this in the NFL, you know, we talk about the insurance policy a lot. We talk a lot about guys where it's like, well, you, know, you play it just in case. Maybe if we need to put them on inactive, we can put them on inactive. But in case you have someone that and perhaps you have a roster piece go down, you always want to have depth available. And uh, getting someone in just in time for a game like this, you know, even if it has to be where he's put in for even basic route concepts in packages, that's not bad. It gives you a body. So good to have, have him in. And he's veteran experience, like you said. He's no stranger to the spring scene, um, game football, pass heavy offenses. So clearly he's going to get, he's gotten reps in the past and he'll be ready to go for this as well. Um, I won't, I don't want to go straight for the neck with this roster move, but of course it made the most waves and, uh, just want to touch on it. Cause I'm, I, I don't think I'm too surprised. Uh, Gene DeLance, he has been released from the DC defenders, uh, the the uh, dreaded week of all weeks is the best way I can put this. Um, when you affect two touchdowns in a game and you also get ejected, uh, also have a, I mean, PFF scores aren't always evaluated by teams, but uh, when you're essentially evaluated as, as arguably one of the worst players of the week in the league entirely, it might be time. And I think, I think just given some of the frustrations from last week in San Antonio, and there was a lot of miscues and mismanagement with that whole game, just that final set of circumstances to where they were could have pulled within at least two and had it flip the script. Ah, unfortunately, I think he gets the scapegoat not easily for this one, just for the, some of those, uh, some of the miscues he especially affected with that last contest. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was getting beat all game. And the funny thing, the, the UFL released a video of some of the mic'd up moments from week one. And you could see Delonte Scott just constantly saying, oh, 59, 59, he sucks, he's garbage, blah, blah, oh blah. My God. And he, I mean, he was kind of right because Delance was getting beat. And I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not a sports better at all. Never bet on sports once. I really wish I could have placed a bet on Delance getting released this week. I could have cashed in some some serious money. That would be a bet that I definitely would have placed if I would have been allowed to. But, <laughs> jokes aside, 
I think it makes, you know, it just makes sense. Like you said, took away two touchdowns. And if you're wondering what the first one was, because obviously there was a whole spitting thing and then he got re- the play got reviewed because there was a delay. But also in the first half, that touchdown pass, I think it was to Kiki Kute. Um, yes. it, he was ineligible downfield, which got that one called back. So, yeah, I mean, not too surprising to see him get let go. And ironically, DC went and picked up Jared Williams, who was with the Brahmas in training camp. So it worked out. Yeah, a little funny how things work out some sometimes. And that I'll be honest with you, both of those are frustrating touchdowns that were reversed. Um, a little bit more so with the first because as a former lineman credit, you can go high school if you want. But look, to me with with linemen, here, here's how it goes. Pass plays, t- tackles have no reason to be moving forward on a pass play. You're expected to make, you're supposed to make the bubble, an arch, if you will. The tackles are expected to collapse back into the pocket more than the, t- than the guards in the, the center. So I have no idea why you would go and chase somebody up the field when in reality, the portion of your wall is sustained. And a lot of times you'll see a lot of film and these, a lot of linemen, what will happen is they'll, instead of being more uh, contained and being more disciplined on the section of their line they're supposed to hold, they'll bail on the contain. They'll see the, they'll get basically like almost like a bull, get red, get turned red and just start chasing the defender. Almost like they just want to hit the guy. That's fine and all, but as you saw with Delance, there's no reason to be five to six yards upfield when you're a tackle like that. That one frustrated me so much more than the false start because I get the false start a little bit. He's been beaten all game. He actually got away with one earlier in the game that kind of foreshadowed this one somehow. But that first one, James, that really grinded my gears as a former lineman because, again, just no reason. There's no reason unless the play is designed that way or if it's even if it's if it's an RPO, that's the minimum. But like even then, no reason. It's a perfectly placed ball, too. And it and actually it impacted how the game flow went. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously the second touchdown killed their, their comeback, but that first touchdown, you know, if you score there, that entire game plays out differently because that was earlier on the game. I think that was in the second quarter kind of early on. So you're looking at D.C. either having a lead or at least things being tied up at half, where in reality they went into half with an 11-point deficit. So, you know, it's just the way football works. But, yeah, I've, I've never seen an offensive lineman, at least in the spring scene, do so many detrimental things in one game. So mm. I, I uh for for more of a silver lining, hope he lands on his feet and kind of recoups. I would say give it the roughest of weeks you can ever imagine. But uh it can only go up from here. I right. I would hope. Young young man's got to settle down, reset himself cuz frustration, you don't want this to be what defines you. You know, go back, set yourself up, work hard, and if you want to get back in the game, times now you know take the lessons you will and uh kind of crawl back up uh two more roster moves i do want to bring up i like the rashad torrance move for the roughnecks by the way really young kid adds more safety death and honestly you know for the one thing that the roughnecks defense struggled on you know pressure was no concern against memphis um but they do need more guys in that third level that either can make a more imposing presence over the middle or can at least protect the middle a bit bit better you know and i'm more talking more in an evaluation sense you know i'm not saying torrance right away is going to be thrusted into this role but given you started on one it wasn't an impressive win and i know cj and i know curtis johnson was not happy with that performance after week one whatsoever that's a move where i'm like hey this is a young guy we can bring some evaluation into a position into a position group that maybe didn't impress as much against the showboats and uh i think it's not a bad choice uh if you're wanting to start correcting and tinkering some things defense didn't need much but really when we were watching that game secondary was uh at times a little sparse over the middle and it did kind of become a worrisome trend yeah and uh for Rashad Torrance signing it's a bit of a depth piece it's also a a replacement because Jamari Brown went on injured reserve uh he's having surgery so he's gonna be out for a little while which is why Torrance is coming in and he didn't sign previously because I mean the Jamari Brown injured reserve transaction that happened right before their game so Mm -hmm. you're not really going to see a signing happen over the weekend so it makes sense that that replacement happened now like you said i mean young i feel like he's the type of guy that you want to see in these spring leagues perfect prospect right good college career showed a lot of promise just hasn't been able to find his footing at the professional level quite yet so we'll see with some development i think he could be a good piece for them right i mean 
You talk about young. I mean, dude was just put picked up as a UDFA for the Rams last year. So only just fresh out of college. Yeah, absolutely. You look at the numbers, anything written up on him. You know, kids, kids got the talent. Kids showed that he can put up and can perform when needed. So, uh, you know, this is the type of player when we talk about spring football, I want to see more of these guys try and take their hand. I don't mind you if you have a UDFA offer. Take your shot, kid definitely do it but once that offers up if you don't see like immediate interest to me as long as these as long as ufl can stick around like hey you should start talking with someone from there right away because they're going to want that's the type of player they want you know they want a young gun that's going to you know have that kind of extra i would say energy and a bit extra of like i say drive to try and get back to this level so he's a guy really thrilled to see him get a shot here um kind of wonder what he can do but uh Definitely the prospect. We talk about good players to come into the UFL. You know, the type that you hope to see more of uh, as this league continues to grow. Nice to see a guy like Torrance. I want to see a guy like Torrance more often, James. I'm with you there, 100%. Mm -hmm. Last one I wanted to bring up, uh, Nate Nett Wheeland, inside linebacker, placed on IR this week. Um, you know, just kind of honestly needing to fill up a fill up a bit of a depth piece here and uh you know it's kind of a shame you know i always hate i always bring up i always hate seeing guys like this in these leagues kind of have to go on to the ir um wishing him the bet him the best only just starting off the season too it was a shame yeah you know wyland's a guy that with the roughnecks last year he's with wade phillips and he had some good moments. I know he was also dealing with some injuries last year. And that was a piece that they really wanted to make sure that they secured for this Brahma's team. Uh, I know the, the defensive coordinator, Will Reed, spoke highly of him. And you look at what he did in week one. He played like 12 snaps on defense, but he had a good PFF grade, 75.7. Special teams, though, 10 snaps. He had a 90.9 grade. Like, that's very, very high. He was extremely efficient, made plays all over the place. So tough loss for them. They bring back uh, Kalichi and Yelbechi. So that's a guy that I had predicted would have made this roster in the first place. Very talented linebacker out of mm -hmm. Incarnate Wars. The Browns will be in good shape. But yeah, it is a shame because Wyland's a guy that I really thought with good with a good campaign could have made another NFL push. Not going to lie, the special teams one I think is one that I'll see, you know, if how bad it hurt, hurts. You know, 90 grade's great. But look, you brought up a great point with evaluating the special teams units uh, this week. You know, the Brahma's impressed with the field position starting point for how they were able to mitigate the DC defenders kind of being put behind the eight ball. Um, kicking definitely does that wonders. So uh, shout out to Storing on that for sure. But I mean, that also comes down to an excellent group that can kind of locate and bring down the return man instantly. Uh, you know, no shedding tackles, no having to get stuck on blocks. Um, it's guys like it's guys like Wyland that, you know, not saying it's one man that dictates an entire return unit. But having one less person that might be able to shore that up or isn't as willing to get in the nitty gritty, especially with a UFL return that is more traditional and more impact heavy, that's something I keep an eye on. You know, it's not it's not an instant link, but it is one that could be something to, you know, you have one break one side, perhaps because of that. But I don't think it's going to be instantly the case. Just it just that's a that's a piece you don't want to see as a special teams coordinator is all I'm trying to put it out there. Absolutely. And speaking of special teams coordinators, I got to give a shout out to Peyton Pardee, who's the mm -hmm. guy down there in San Antonio. And he has that unit just rocking and rolling. I know they've talked so highly about him, just talking to some of the specialists there and also talking to Peyton. You know, the, the energy that they have, they, you know, these guys, they're all bought into special teams is what Peyton said. And it showed on Sunday. On Sunday. They played so well, you know, and a play that really stuck out to me was the long snapper Rex Sonahara, I believe on a punt. He obliterated a guy on a tackle like just straight up just destroyed him he didn't even have a chance to return that ball so when you have a long snapper running down there and making a play like that it just goes to show the intensity the energy and just the cohesiveness that this group has one week into the season so it's great stuff out of san antonio absolutely yeah special teams being such an effort part of the ball and because you really you line up for only a few select plays a game so having your guys more behind and understand the mission as, as you will. And I think have the tenacity to be wanting to go and get a hit and have the fundamentals to go and bring someone down. That's great to see. And it's not just the gunners. It's not just, you know, the guys that are the speed that are the fullbacks or the running backs, maybe that are trying, trying to get the snap off. The linemen too are so crucial. And especially the edge guys on that said line after the snap and after you prevent from getting a block. So good to see, love to hear it. 
All right, James. Now's the time. Ready? We're going to break down some games. It's week two. Everything's all set up to go. And uh, funny enough, we talked about the Brahmas. Why not just kick this off? Let's talk about the Brahmas here. San Antonio, they are going to go on the road. Memphis gets to host the first home game of the season. Uh, crowd's looking fun. I know I've been trying to keep up with the Yacht Club lately on kind of all things going down. Tickets are $10, by the way. That's a, They're going with a special promo right now for that. So uh, if you're wanting to get in right now, now's the time. The home game is going to be packed out over in Memphis, and they're going to be rowdy up in the Yacht Club. Uh, quick, quick preliminary thoughts, James, that I got right here. Um, look, you know me last, last eight to you. I'm the skeptic of the Brahmas. Um, I want to see if they can be adapt, if they can keep adapting the offense. I know AJ can do that. Um, but I know you can't use the same bag of tricks that you could from week one is what I'm going to be seeing here. Memphis for my takes here is the one that I have actually more evaluated under the gun. Again, most disappointing team to me last week in a win. Can they find a run game and as you brought up in press conference discussion, does Trey Williams get involved in that backfield this week so they don't have to lean on Darius Victor being the only asset in the backfield? Yeah, absolutely. And to, to your point, these teams, they won, and they both still have something to prove, right? Where San Antonio, now they have to go out and do it again. Now they have to go out and prove that they are a team that is the team to beat in the XFL conference. For the Memphis Showboats, now, I talked to John D. Filippo today, actually, uh, during his presser, and his immediate comment about the offense was, it was horrible. Horrible on first down. That, that was his exact words. You know, it he said atrocious. they did terrible. And they he said that they had 19 plays where they were second and at least eight yards to go. And there's a reason why that offense really struggled, and Case Cookus was able to bail them out on a bunch of third downs. But that's not not going to continue throughout the entire season. You're not going to be able to keep up that high percentage, especially against some of these defenses. The Brahmas, their pass rush is so fierce. They had four sacks on Jordan Tamu last week. So that can't happen again. The offensive line play was pretty poor in Memphis. They really have to step up and improve that. But the D. Filippo's point, I mean, yeah, the, the, the first down offense, there was no run game whatsoever. And that's something that he said they're emphasizing this week. They really want to make sure they come out of the gate strong and set the tone because they put themselves behind the eight ball in that category last week. They can't afford to do that again. Now, uh, another thing DeFilippo said was he looks at San Antonio and he said that they were unbelievably solid across the board. You know, he looks, there's so much talent there in that group. It's going to be a tough game. I, I, I do see the Brahmas as the favor in this one, just, just because Houston, I know some people aren't going to like this. I'm sorry, ref. Like you said, they have the clear cut eight in this league right now. So the show both beating the clear cut eight, it's not a huge deal. Like you're kind of expecting Memphis no. to win that game. You know what I mean? It was a great win on the road, but like you said, so much to clean up. Where San Antonio, everyone counted them out in that game coming into it, um, except for me. I did. I did predict that they would win, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I just had to shout that out. Hey, now you could stomp on it. You could. You stand your ground. I get it. <laughs> no, no, no. It. But. Seriously, you know, D.C., 9-1 and one last year, they were the team to beat in the XFL Conference, and the Brahmins took care of business. Like you said, there's room to improve, but I just feel like with their playmakers, right, Anthony McFarland looks so dynamic. Chase Garber was very poised in his first game. We see a lot of quarterbacks come in and play their first games, and they look rattled. They look shaky in the pocket. I mean, he was tossing balls right off the bat with confidence, with poise. So we'll see how things go this week, but I I'm pretty confident in San Antonio. I, I will tell you, if I had to pick one, I, it's going to have to be the Brahmas because, like I said, I don't – week one is hard, is going to be something that I don't want to always put down as the defi definitive way I should view a team. But I'm also not going to sit here and tell you that I was thoroughly impressed with Memphis last week. And, again, I think that there's things that are exploitative that the Brahmas can take advantage of. And you just brought up something that, again, I was I was distraught seeing Memphis this past week in the fact that Case Cookus is taking hits again because I thought this was going to be a trend that would go away, you know, th that they would finally let him stand in the pocket. He's not going to get whacked all game and not going to get beaten up and have to sit out for a little bit of time during some portion of the year. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but the trend already is heading that direction. I don't like seeing that. I don't like seeing him get hit. It's not getting easier. Houston, to me, is one of the better front sevens in the league, and the Brahmas showed – just as equally last week against DC that, uh, yeah, not too shabby a deal either. Now credit 
we did see some of the flaws in that front five that DC has, and they might have their own things to discuss that we have to figure out, of course, with that whole setup in their front line. But Memphis, for the talents I listed in my preview in week for week one that I thought was going to be a strength in kind of mitigating a team without a Chris Odom on the other side, uh, was not impressed. And it's going to be something that's going to be under the under the gun that I, you and I will be watching. And as John knows, that run game cannot be what <laughs> the showboats use all year. You know, showboats fans under <laughs> under different circumstances last year uh, under Todd Haley saw how atrocious that was, and this should not be Todd Haley's run game that we are used to. This is John D. Filippo, who did an excellent job with West Hills and company last year, and has two dynamic playmakers alone off the top of my head with Trey Williams and Darius Victor at his disposal. I don't know what's going on with that, but that needs to be figured out, and it freaks me out. Otherwise, Memphis, otherwise, it to me, biggest challenge of the season quite far on defense, given Houston's, uh, I would say, a lot of incompetency going on there and missing Mark Thompson. Um, but, you know, I wonder, and uh, James, I want to hear your thoughts. Do you think they can slow down this A.J. Smith offense? The tricks can't be as present this week. You, you threw some of the, the specialty plays out of the bag last week, but, uh, you know, Still, some of the core elements of that A.J. Smith offense will be there at your disposal to uh, analyze and try and take advantage of. Or yeah, disadvantage. And, and in my opinion, I think A.J. Smith's offense will be even better this week because they have another week of practice under the belts and they have film to actually look at and go back and be like, all right, this is what we did well. This is what we did wrong. This is what we have to improve upon. And I think A.J. Smith is one of the most brilliant minds in this entire league. You just look at what he's done. I mean, the fact that they won seven games last year, and I mean no disrespect by this, but they won seven games with Brandon Silvers as QB1. That says something. That says something about his system. That says something about what he can do and what he brings to a team. So now that you have Chase Garbers, who's a lot more dynamic and can use his legs, which we saw, I just think that as this unit's going to continue to grow. I could be wrong, but they're just a team that have so much upside, and I, I see them having another good game. Memphis, they have a great defense. I like what they – I mean, Kyrie Woods back there, Christian McFarland, those guys are making plays, but – I don't like just the fact like looking at McFarland and how explosive he is out of the backfield. They just have so much talent. And you got John Trey Kirkland back and he looked phenomenal. You picked up guys like Marquez Stevenson. Where did he come from? He looks phenomenal. He's so right. fast, you know, and they run all these different motions. They run these screens. They run these quick plays to get the hand, get the ball in the hands of their speedsters. Justin Smith, another guy that just is, has runs a phenomenally fast, fast 40. So across the board, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see. Yeah, we'll find out for sure. Um, any score prediction? Uh, it sounds like both of us are picking the Brahmas. So, how close do you think this is going to be, James? I'm gonna. I I think the Brahmas are gonna take this one by at least a few points. I'm going. Uh, let's see. Twenty four sixteen, San Antonio. Modest, modest. Uh, I'm gonna go here in kind of similar vein. I don't think they come anywhere breaking thirty. Um, I think you still got a few things to work out, but I, I do think it's, uh, I do think Memphis gets held to below 20. So yeah, give me like, uh, yeah, I'll make it unique. Give me like 25, 13. Uh, I'll give that San Antonio. Um, that's just based off what I saw last week. Things could change, but you know, doesn't a lot of stuff in football doesn't change week to week that quickly. So yeah, 25, 13, uh, San Antonio is a lock for both of us. Pound that one in, not lock it down. Number two. Second game, Arlington Renegades going to St. Louis. We know the crowd's going to be big, James. We know it's going to be a massive X factor. Um, yeah, a little bit of that, intel, if you don't mind, um, yeah. about that crowd. Uh, speaking with the comms guy in St. Louis a little bit earlier this week, he said that they are potentially, and I'd like to emphasize, potentially on pace to break that record. There's still some work to be done, but they're looking really, really good across the board. And as of two weeks ago, there are 30% more season tickets sold than they were at the same time a year ago. So that is really good news. That is great to see. St. Louis has always been such a good market, but I think this year could be an even better year now that the team's coming back for a second season. So My just had God. to get that out there. My God, it keeps growing. It, it, it's, it's like it's an, endless, it's an endless, endless onslaught of just great fan support. I I'm I can't no words can add on to how impressed everyone should be at that. Uh 30% increase year over year, even with a merger year to throw in the boot. Wow. 
just just wow it's good it's great um keep adding the hype up and they could break that record i, I it's gonna happen this year i think um best chance would be week one most likely uh and hey keep pushing up the sales if you have if you're on the fence for some reason uh why you would you on the now, fence man i mean i, I don't know what to why are you it. yeah <laughs> why are you on the fence first off <laughs> go buy a ticket there's cheap seats up at the 400 levels that are on sale there's new seats in the 300s that just went on sale that uh gavin on our, our representative st Lu st louis writer just mentioned to us all on twitter recently uh yeah plenty of places to sit down and enjoy a game i've been to the battle dome it's a not bad of a spot to watch a football game you should check it out you know help support a good cause help support spring football it's going to be great now the play on field that's going to be something to analyze i'll be frank with you james i didn't think st louis was too far off anyway from well having a different outcome and having a different narrative going into la this week uh my curiosity is how much does aj mccarron get his way because on hot mic sounds like he was getting restricted and i don't think he wants to be restricted anymore in how he leads this offense it, it almost sounds like a tom brady-esque quality of saying give me the keys to the car i don't need bruce doing <laughs> and choosing what i need to be running when i know what i feels best i feel like there's going to be some maybe not maybe i'm crazy but i feel like there's going to be a little bit of a power struggle of sorts uh that needs to be solved in the early weeks because it's going to keep on boiling over if you see bruce calling run plays when he doesn't want to run or not giving AJ opportunities to throw a pass when he feels like he can take control of the game. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the specific spot that we're looking at is that fourth down stop for Michigan where they ran the ball on third down and then ran it again on fourth. And AJ really wanted to throw it there. And I feel like he had the right to say that. Now, Anthony Beck in the press conference, he was talking about how he just felt like if you have a yard to go, you know, he, he brought in offensive linemen and he brought back offensive linemen that he trusts in, right? And for him, mm -hmm. That that kind of play call there, that decision to run the ball was him putting it on his offensive lineman and telling him, look, I brought you here because I trust you to pick up a yard when we need to pick up a yard. So that was his thought process there. Now, A.J. McCarron, I mean, he's A.J. McCarron for a reason. He's in this league. He's probably the top quarterback, give or take. I mean, him, Matt Corral are up there at least as accomplishment-wise, you know. Th th they have the right to be able to call stuff like that sometimes. So I think we see a little bit more freedom from him in the future. I really would like to see McCarron have the opportunity to air it out a bit earlier in the game. I feel mm -hmm. like that would really help their offense out a lot. They kind of stuck to some basic plays. It's hard. And here's the thing. It's week one. You kind of the flesh out. You, you really have to build that chemistry, break off the rust. They looked very rusty in that first half. And then finally, that second half, those couple last drives, they looked really solid. I think we'll see that carry over into week two we'll see i that I, that's just my gut feeling but yeah we'll see i i, I want a better run game personally it's going to be hard because wayne gallman was supposed to be the guy that at least credit you know like you talked about bringing back quality linemen from last year kind of beefing up that section you know gallman i thought was supposed to be the guy that ties this piece together and it is not it, at least week one it didn't show it now credit that could speak to michigan's own defensive front but that being said just felt like that should have been a more elevated portion of their offensive game plan. Now, Arlington, I think, is a good setup to test that theory. Um, CJ Marable did have a solid day. You know, if it wasn't for Wes Hills, we'd be talking about Marable's day a little bit more against and Ricky Person, too. I yeah, mean, and Ricky both. Person as well. I, dude, I love Ricky Person out of the backfield. He is a, just the, the, the freaking. You know, he, he kind of reminds me of a slightly smaller Bo Scarborough with better hands. And I want to. I want to see how they keep using him as a second a great as a pickup, second man. option. Just a great fantastic pick. pickup. Like absolutely freaking loot. Zach Fodder. But to get back to this game, yeah. So I, I thought there was a there was a couple of plays. So I went back and watched a film of the Panthers Battle Hawks game because I was on the sideline. So I want to go back and see it from the broadcast perspective. And something I really noticed was, you know, Michigan's defensive line, they just set the tone right off the bat. They were so aggressive. Down the stretch, there were a couple of times where Gallman did show some explosiveness. He he there was a play, I think it was like a second and 12, where he burst out to the right side and just really got through a hole very quickly and picked up the first down on his own. We need to see more of that. We need to see more of the mm -hmm. push from their offensive line. And something to note, Jacob Sailors, he really struggled, and the depth chart just came out. He's inactive this week. They're bringing up Mateo Durant, right. who was a guy that was utilized in St. Louis last year. So I think 
He's a guy that could probably provide a little bit of stability. He's familiar with the offense already. He was with the team last year. I think Durant and Gallman could be a much better two, one-two punch there. And like you mentioned, Arlington's defense, they there were some moments there. And here's the thing. The Renegades, I know we talked about this on ATU. They retooled some of these spots. You know, they, they got rid of TJ Barnes. They got rid of some of their starters in the secondary and guys that made a big impact on that defense last year. And it showed in that second half. Like, they could not slow Birmingham down. Mm-hmm. No. I I think that what I think that what happened was is, you know, it seems like, and to me, this is where coaching comes in sometimes. And uh, to me, it seemed like if I had to pick from that contest, Skip Holtz adjusted, his crew adjusted very well to what was getting was going on with the game plan. Bob Stoops, it's weird. Like, kind of reminds me of the beginning of the year. It's, you know, coordinators and company, they're not, they stick to a game plan, but it's almost the detriment of the entire game where they don't seem to want to kind of deviate too much. And I'm wondering if that's going to be something that maybe gets addressed a bit more. I'm hoping is the case uh, because, you know, slow start, they fast starts, not bad, but I don't think Arlington is the type of team that so far has proven to me that they can uh, switch things up on the fly. Um, kind of reminded me of last year before Louise Prez came in. And now, as we saw against Birmingham, Louise, great start, but once the defense figured everything out, starts getting a little bit of pressure, things kind of fall apart. And again, like we talked about on ATU, right? Where is the run game? Why are mm-hmm. we still using the same? And that's the thing that I don't Why understand. is Smith still there if he's not producing? You know, that's like, the thing. How, how do you look at one of your biggest weak points from a season ago and now, like we mentioned, from we're from 16 teams down to eight, the competition basically is twice as good now. How do you stick with the same players? And again, it's no disrespect to these guys, but you have Day Day Hunter s- sitting there just unused, and the depth chart came out. He's inactive again. I just don't understand that, especially his last year at Liberty where he was a playmaker. He just was out there week in and week out doing things for the Flames. Just give him a shot. Give him an opportunity. I feel like they need a little bit more production out of that backfield than Davion Smith. He's the bell cow guy. You know, you want to bring him in for those third and goal situations where you need two yards and get up the middle. Get, but and, and also, I will say, Smith is very good at catching the ball out of the backfield. I feel like that mm-hmm. might be why he has the role that he has because he can come out of the backfield, pick up six yards, pick up five yards. But he's the guy that should be doing that on third down. He shouldn't be out there running the ball on first down. He shouldn't be out there running the ball on second down. I, I, just, I just don't see it. I just don't see a winning offensive strategy with with that system in place and I thought that it would change because last year Jonathan Hayes was calling the plays this year the co-offensive coordinator Chuck Long he's the sole guy there I thought we'd see a little difference but so far it's it's a lot the same yeah and they're gonna have to jump in right away I don't I don't foresee St. Louis uh, having a second straight week not to mention you know I don't always want to factor crowds immediately in but look that home that home atmosphere is so different from the rest of the league because of the fact that you are having a full, a near full stadium on your side and it's an NFL atmosphere. Um, it's going to be harder to pull things off. You know, it's going to be harder to get calls down. It's going to be harder to communicate. Frustrations will boil over possibly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not lo- liking the vibe of what Arlington started the season with. And I don't think this is going to end up a very good game for them right now. Um, if, my assumptions are correct and Stoops and Chuck Long and company are stuck in their ways. Like they have proven to be a lot of times the last two seasons with this iteration of the renegades. So uh, yeah, I'll I'll lead off with the score on this one, James. Um, I'm going to say this is one of the, I think another two score game for the renegades. They go down. Give me a, give me like a 28 to uh, 14, 13 on this. Um, I think it'll be, I think it's gonna be similar deal like Birmingham. Close first half, but as we'll see, I have a little more faith that Anthony Beck will change the game plan compared to Bob Stoops. I don't know what is with Bob Stoops and you know second half game plan stands like they're stretched to a championship last year, but it just doesn't seem to gel. It's almost like he, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Except it was bro, it's been broke, and you know a lot of times in the last two years, and fixes don't really happen. It's just you assume things work out. I, I two two possession loss to me. I got St. Louis in this. 
No, I'm with you there. And I think uh, St. Louis will be the team that breaks 30. I think they're going to come out hot. I think they're going to come out upset. I think they're not happy with how things went. Obviously, losing a game like that is tough. you got the home crowd. You saw the way the offense in the fourth quarter really clicked. I think they'll kind of go back to some of those things that worked. Against the young Arlington secondary, I'm taking those wide receivers. I'm thinking St. Louis 31. Arlington, we're looking at around 18 points. Man. Got to – so they get a loss so hard that the Renegades lose the R on their helmet and finally put the damn <laughs> the damn Renegade logo back on. It's going that way, too. They need to do it sooner rather than later. So come on, UFL, do the right thing. We need you, please. Fans want it, too. That's all I got to tell you. All right, Sunday slate. This is the one. I'm going to try and not be a homer. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, pull back my overreactions possibly from last week. Birmingham travels to Michigan. Michigan gets a second straight home game up there at Ford Field. Stallions, impressive against the Renegades like we just talked about. First half, maybe a little sluggish, but they ended it with a bang, and it just didn't stop. And, well, Michigan ended it with quite a bang, 64-yard field goal, but showed offensive light at the end of the second half. Promising. My question is, though, is it enough to overcome a Stallions team that I think in a lot of regards, I have way more high value on and I think find very scary given the week one projections came out as expected. And not to mention, James, I think the coaching mismatch is the is arguably the greatest mismatch of the weekend because Mike Nolan still hasn't figured out how to do clock or timeout management very well. It showed last week it almost burned them in that win. Skip Holtz is a completely different level, as we've seen. One of the best coaches in spring football when it comes to adjustments on the fly, in-game, or at halftime. That's going to be the hardest thing is, can this team stay disciplined? Can they avoid the mistakes that has defined Michigan Panthers football for the majority of their last two years? And can Mike Nolan call a decent game? That's all I ask. Can these things happen? Yeah, so I was on the show earlier this morning, shout out 97.7 ESPN, and something nice. that I said was you can't pick against a team that still hasn't lost. Birmingham is now 22-3, and three, and it's like until they start losing, I just can't pick against them, right? I mean, yeah. we saw how dominant they were in the second half, and that's another game that I went back and rewatched some of that film. In the second half, the way they just put Arlington, just backed them up in a corner and took control. I mean, it, you, I, it's just typical Birmingham Stallions. And here's the thing. Michigan is extremely talented. We saw what they were able to do in that second half. I thought they showed a lot of progress offensively. But Birmingham, 16 guys on that team are former NFL draft picks, not to mention yeah. all the other guys that were undrafted free agents that went to the NFL and now are in Birmingham. It's just a team that they put together. The, the fact that I, I want to shout out Nicholas Thorne for making this comment. He said, you know, with all those new pieces – they were curious. Like it might take two, three weeks to build chemistry. It took Birmingham a half. It took them one half of football to figure it out. And then that second half, just domination. So I'm I'm a little bit scared for the Panthers here just because if Matt Corral comes out slinging it the way that he was in that second half, it's gonna be interesting. And and for Michigan, the good news and and I think the something that they can rely on is their defense was so good across the board, especially their run defense. You know, I don't think it'll be as easy for C.J. Mar Marable and Ricky Person this time around. you got guys, Breland Speaks, Daniel Wise up there making all sorts of plays. The linebacker group, I mean, Frank Ginda had a little bit of an off, not an off day by any means, just like four tackles, not like eye-popping stats. But the thing is, they not didn't throw it his way. You look mm -hmm. at the, with the film, they were keeping the ball away from Frank Ginda because they know how good he is. So... You know, I, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. But I think Birmingham is a favor just given their – I just can't pick Michigan because I don't see them winning this game. I just don't see them winning this game. I, my, own, my only saving grace to this, and I, I know it's what the Stallions are going to target, is I think they are going to try their damnedest to shut down West Hills and to see if they can make it where it's EJ Perry has to dictate the football game. I'm not saying EJ can't, but given that they've still, you know, had some complications and EJ did only go 50% from the from the from Sling and the Rock, you know, West Hills leading rusher in the league, that's your number one challenge is if you can stop Wes and if you can dominate that front five and keep lanes from being open, EJ has to start finding receivers and more thoroughly. So Birmingham's assignment is going to be stopping West Hills. That's going to be the main thing. On the flip side of this, you know, if I'm Michigan, 
I mean, sure, you can pick and choose, but I think your biggest struggle, as we saw at the end of the second half, is hey, can when the going gets tough, can we lock down in the secondary? Because there were some, at least in the second half, once things started kind of going and progressing, some leakiness happened with a few of the receivers. Credit, you know, credit Aitman had an incredible catch on the sideline to help with this with that effort for St. Louis, but. Guys like a Deion Kane, guys like an Amari Rogers, they found open lanes open and often. Jay Sternberger, I think he's somehow going to elevate his performance from last year. He was like, at least first half going into the second at times, he felt like he was going to be the number one target all game until Deion Kane finally started catching some repertoire with Matt Corral. And you don't want to see either one of those guys start catching on and getting on fire. Um, can they lock down the secondary? I think it's going to be a passing game that dictates who wins. Um, both are going to try and slow down the ground attack as best they can. Um, and I have more faith in Birmingham on the air attack, no matter, really, no matter who's behind, no matter who's going to be behind center, even, and I believe it's Matt Corral is going to get most of the reps. They'll throw Adrian Martinez for like a possession or two. Cause it's skip Holtz and he wants to have the running gadget edness of Martinez, but Corral, if he's settled in and if he gets the jitters out and he, that, and that first half was to get, those jitters of being playing again out. Watch out. Michigan's going to have that to ha to deal with. That's their main problem. That's going to be having to deal with next week or this weekend. Yeah. And, and the thing that sticks out to me is West Hills. He had such a good week one performance, but Birmingham has proven that they can slow him down. And they did in that playoff game last year when he was in new Orleans. Right? So if West Hills isn't able to produce, it's going to be a struggle because I, just looking at the names on both sides, that Stallion secondary is better than the Michigan wide receivers. It's just straight up. They have the more talent in that secondary. It's going to be tough for these guys to get open. And I think EJ Perry, the problem for him is if Wes Hills isn't providing him with production, and we saw this in the first half especially where he tried to play a little bit of hero ball, it could get a little bit ugly. And there's a, there was a PFF stat looking at turnover-worthy plays from quarterbacks in week one. Most of the quarterbacks had one or two. EJ Perry had five. That's a problem. That yeah. is a problem. Yeah. He's so talented, but the thing is he's got to calm down. He's got to realize that he can use his legs and really just make smarter decisions with the football. If he does that, it'll give Michigan a chance. I'm just worried that, you know, Stallions have so many opportunistic guys like Mark Gilbert, you know, the fumble recovery, the interception last week. You know he's going to be out there making plays. They got Kenny Robinson out there. He's phenomenal with the St. Louis Battle Hawks and then has been in the NFL so you got guys that are opportunistic in that defense. There's no room for mistake for the, for Michigan. Like they have to play a perfect game straight up. No, no. So I, my score prediction, I uh, I'm going to go with Birmingham coming away with a 20. Let's see, I'm going to go 26 17 win. I see you. I see you. Just a, just in the range of one score. You know, there'll be something like that that could be like desperation last play. Um, and I, I do think that. Michigan's defense will keep it a little closer than it should be. Um, I don't know if I have full faith that offensively Michigan's going to be able to keep up. And like we said, especially with West Hills, they can kind of they kind of have a bit of a resume on him on what they need to look for. So, yeah, I'm going to be with you. Give me uh, give me 24 to 18. I'll give it that. A little closer, but still. I think it's going to be more that Michigan rallies to get maybe one score later in the fourth. Don't I don't expect this to be something that maybe feels in the close, but who knows? Maybe I'll be surprised. Birmingham is the one I got to pick. Just like you said, it's hard to pick a team that's against a team that's lost only three times in two plus years. Right. You, insane how that is. Three times in two plus years, people that you don't hear that much. God, and everybody God said, damn, that, that oh, now that the merger happened, they're not going to be dominant. What do they do? They go out and just dominate against the XFL champions. So I'm, just it's unreal. Just, <laughs> they are freaking It literally unreal. is a dynasty. And it's, I mean, I'm Switzerland, but it is slightly frustrating. It's like, I want to see some other teams win, man. I just. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we got nine weeks to go in playoffs. Anything can happen. You know, but they do look like the uh, they do look like the unstoppable force uh, with no immovable object uh, anywhere in sight. <laughs> so wherever that comes up, we will see by the end of the season. Final game of the weekend, James. And uh, look, I think people just want to honestly. This is the uh, this is the pick yourself up by the bootstraps game because both of these teams, I, I think, 
need to show something better <laughs> than what they did last week. Houston, I'm again, not to rail, and I know the ref's not here, but first off, they're not going 12 and all anymore. So you can knock that one off. The mailman's clearly here because of uh, reasons that need to be for justifying. There's no undefeated season anymore, but they need to come out and show some sort of cohesion uh, offensively that allows Jared Garantano to either establish himself or Garantano needs to get rid of the ball faster. And if Mark, and if we don't see Mark Thompson, they need to stay and dedicate themselves a bit more to the run game with TJ Pledger is all the best I can tell you. Find some more identity. They, they are very lost in the identity department, um, which DC is also very much in that same category of somewhat lost in the identity department, as you have pointed out on many occasions on ATU. Um, and I think, that, like I said, I think this is really like a showcase for their fan base to say, okay, how much did we improve in a week? Did we figure ourselves out a little bit? And I do think there is one that I still feel clearly will get a win, but I'm going to be evaluating this game more as, okay, did any, did either of you move the needle in making changes to help me evaluate you better for what lies ahead for the rest of your season, specifically DC, I think, um, mitigate them, limit the mistakes, dedicate yourself more to the run and, uh, maybe hope to God passes don't get dropped on a more regular basis. I'm not sure what to tell you there, but, um, very much is going to be a rowdy game out there in the capital region with a lot of, I think under the microscope to film to review after this one's done. Absolutely. And I think you had said that Memphis was a team on the USFL side that really disappointed you. DC for me was a team on the XFL side that really disappointed me. You know, it's just, it was very uncharacteristic, not the type of performance that you'd expect from a team with Reggie Barlow, the XFL coach of the year. And honestly, you know, a lot of stuff wasn't necessarily his fault. Like you said, drop passes, spitting mm -hmm. on the players and causing touchdowns, <sighs> running up the field when you don't have to run up the field to block, things like that. Yeah. By the end of the day, you know, these are the things that the coaching staff has to make sure doesn't happen again. You know, that's their job. Their job is to make sure that these players execute. And they're clearly making those decisions by getting rid of a player that caused problems and bringing someone else in. So right, the good right steps in the right direction there for DC. But I do think the defenders are the favorite because Jordan Tamu, we know, has so much experience. And that's the thing. If you look at the experience he has compared to the experience that Garantano has in this scene, and it's stark contrast. So I, I feel like the defenders, they'll be able to put things a little bit more together now. They have a week under their belt. The struggle for them, can they protect for Tamu? Because they gave yeah. up four sacks, and Houston's defensive line is, is very stout, and they might have Chris Odom this week as well. So that's a factor. Now, it doesn't seem like Mark Thompson's going to play. Still no official word on that yet, but it's definitely looking less and less likely that he'll be available. And if that's the case, that's a tough look for the Roughnecks because they were just all out of sorts offensively. TJ Pledger, just, I don't know, I just didn't see it. And I don't, they just didn't utilize Ty and Evans at all. You know, Evans is a guy that no. I felt like should get more touches. He had a productive season, a couple of seasons at Tennessee. He's a guy that has some NFL experience. And he's a guy that I think could spark some things for them on offense, but unfortunately not not utilized last week much at all. We'll see if that changes. That Curtis Johnson is a guy that I love him as a coach. You know, he's a great guy. He's, he's a great coach, but he's made some questionable decisions. We saw that last year with the Gamblers, and we've seen it a little bit this year as well. So you know, his two QB system. Reed Sinet only played I think one drive in that yes. game, but I, I don't know. It's just Houston across the board, like. The talent is there, but it's like the, the trust in the execution simply is not. And until yeah. I see something different, it's going to be hard to really have any faith in that organization at all. You know, Isaiah Henney fumbling twice. Like, that's uncharacteristic for him. I mean, that's a guy that was all USFL last year. So those sorts of things, they just didn't look like a professional football team out there. I don't know. It's yeah, talk about someone that definitely needs a, re a reset for a week is Isaiah Isaiah Henney. I, look, I mean, they got pieces. Like I said, Henny Henny clearly is a playmaker when he is in his on his A game. You know, Justin Hall was probably one of the brighter spots that the Roughnecks had during that contest against the Showboats. So, you know, I think to me, I've always liked when they give him more reps. He's always to me has been under receiving of reps and receiver or even running for say like you know boot sweeps or whatnot and i think that he could be or jet sweeps and i think that he could be someone they could utilize a little bit more because he's not only a fast runner he's a hard runner too on that offense he's a small guy that's hard to take down he hits with aggression 
lean into him a little bit more. You know, get get into players that are going to help get a net positive. I think that's Houston's. It's just it's weird. There's it's almost like they're still in evaluations right now. It's almost like training camp hasn't fully ended for the Roughnecks. They're one that's just get some positive movement here against the defenders. It's not going to be easy. That that Audi field will be loaded. Um, selling even more seats. You talk about two arenas that have opened seats up. DC also has. They're going to be pushing that sales number that they have for the max capacity. So uh, it'll be loud. It'll be rowdy, as expected. And that's the defenders at least have in their corner. Um, I hope to God they have Chris Odom, because you're absolutely right. Um, if there's any saving grace, and I think Nick brought this up on ATU, um, it's a play from ahead team. Good defense. It needs to get some quick scores to kind of start putting pressure on the other side. Um, Chris would definitely help with that right now, um, especially with DC still kind of figuring themselves out. I think if the drops get mitigated, that DC is going to have a day. Because quite frankly, I thought that's one of the main reasons they burned themselves against San Antonio anyhow. So we'll see. But uh, Chris and Adam Rodriguez getting in the backfield would be nice. It's a shame with the cap. By the way, the calf sprain for Ruben Foster affecting him, you know, not being as available, but, uh, you know, yeah, still. will be okay. The calf, it was not a calf sprain. It was just a cramp. Uh, so. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, he, he should be just fine uh, from everything I've heard. Uh, the guy, the thing to keep an eye on for me with DC is, like we talked about, where what is their identity going to be this year? Last week, it was a mess. <laughs> their identity was just yeah. being a mess. So can you find replacements for Abram Smith? Can you find replacements in that receiver room? We saw a couple guys make some plays. Ty Scott had some nice catches. He also had a couple drops. You know, these guys, they had balls in their hands. Brandon Smith, that's a guy that Reggie Barlow has said time and time again, he sees Brandon Smith as a guy that can be wide receiver one. He dropped at least one pass and just had a couple plays that, like, those just messy across the board and stuff that you wouldn't expect from a team that won nine games in the regular season last year. So we'll see how that all flushes out. I, I, I see DC as the favorite simply because you can't necessarily judge them on just one game, right? The, the Roughnecks is a little bit different because that team, a lot of the same pieces from last year and they were five and five kind of mediocre DC still eyeing a championship run. If they can put the pieces together, especially with Jordan Tommy back there. So we'll see. I think it's going to be a bit of an ugly game. I'm not going to lie. I think the defenders come same. out and win. I think that's going to be something like, 18 to 11. Give me, give me 18, 10. Give me 18, 10. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, going to be, going to be kind of, kind of an awkward game. Um, and one that I think, uh, people will, you know, you'll see more of the diehards tune in for is the best way I'm going to put it. Um, yeah, I'm with you though. Give me like 16. Yeah, I'll, I'll go like, I'll keep, I think both score double digits. So I'm, I'm going to kind of cheat off you with here. I'm gonna go 16, 10. I think it'll be a little closer. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a slow grind. Both of them are going to be kind of still figuring themselves out. Uh, but it won't be pretty. I, I don't see any pretty football being played to uh, end and cap off the week. <laughs> well, hey, uh, shout out Von Hutchins with the hashtag slow grind. That's like his catchphrase. So you just pop <laughs> it up, give it to him, DC, DPP, slash general manager. Shout out Von. Grind uh, them yeah. lemons, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's exciting. I, I mean, that game is on Fox, so I'm really hoping it's a good atmosphere there at Audi Field because, you know, the broadcast is going to be solid. Oh, it'll be rocking. They'll have a great time out there. Um, you know, I, I think, I mean, like I said, atmosphere will be great. Football on the field? Don't know about that. Don't know about that. So, well, James, I think we got our guys ready to go. Week two is upon us. It's going to be a hell of a week. Any final thoughts before we kick this bad boy off? Hey, thanks for coming on, by the way. Uh, Absolutely. No curtains. This is very last last minute. It's just been, uh, it's been kind of hectic for all of us to kind of get back into regular life outside of essentially coming back from vacation. So, you know, I appreciate you coming on. No, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, some final thoughts. I think we're going to be in for some good football. I think, I hope, and I think that the football will be a little bit cleaner, you know, week two. You got the first week under your belt. Hopefully some of those nerves are out for a couple of guys. And again, just another week of practice. And again, and the most important thing is now you have game film to look at, which is mm -hmm. by far the best thing for coaches to actually point out in-game scenarios, what you're supposed to do. And I thought 
a couple of comments that were interesting, like one talking to Donnie Abraham, the DC in St. Louis, he was talking about Willie Harvey and the performance he had, you know, he led the team in tackles. He's a team captain this year, a guy that has a lot and really had a great game. But, uh, Donnie Abraham said that, you know, he looked at the film and he saw a few plays where Harvey could have still made an impact and he just didn't. So, you know, those are the things that we'll see clean up and guys that were standouts already will get even better moving forward. So it's exciting. And I'm looking forward to it. This opening game, the DC, DC, San Antonio and Memphis. Uh, yeah, it's late, man. It, I'm not I'm telling you. It's, I know, I know. It's late. <laughs> it's, la- it's late. It's late over here, even for me, over in Arizona. Uh, early games, though. By the way, that's one thing I'll highlight. So San Antonio. Remember, it's uh, noon Eastern. This one's kicking off. So yeah, if you're any earlier, you know, get up in the morning, grab a cup of Joe, and uh, sit down for some football. I know I will. It'll be nine o'clock when that goes off. I got two nine a.m. games this week, so uh, get to start my day off right. Uh, well, James, for yourself, thank you for joining. Zach Kyleman here, and we're going to sign off. It's been episode 80 of the UFO podcast. Catch us Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern time, like I said, around the UFL. It's your biggest recap show and giving you great interviews and discussion from all of our PFN crew. You don't want to miss it. We're just heating things up. We're just getting started. And uh, until next time, everybody, we'll catch you on the flip side. Stay classy. Enjoy the football this weekend, everyone. See you around.